If you roughly know how goal routines work, but never took the time to learn the idiomatic approach and study different concurrency patterns, this video will provide some context on how go routines can be used. I'll be covering how to wait for other go routines to finish instead of exiting on the main go routine, compare unbuffered and buffered channels as well as the pros and cons of each, before going over how to run go routines inside the loop, and limiting parallelism using semaphores. And I'll wrap it up with using the select statement to multiplex different channels and cancel go routines to prevent go routine leaks. We will also cover what a go routine leak is and how we can prevent it, and whether we need to close all the channels and go routines, and why we would want to have our wait group in its own go routine. So starting from the first bullet point, we want to see how to wait for other go routines to finish instead of just exiting on the main go routine. So we have a go routine here, and we also have an unbuffered channel called done. So one of the main characteristic of an unbuffered channel is that it is blocking until it receives a value from the channel. So what we are trying to do is run some operation inside the go routine and only at the end of the go routine, we send an empty struct down to the done channel to report its completion. So this is blocking until it receives a report of completion from the go routine and exits only when we receive a value from the done channel. So this is a very basic pattern where we can see different go routines synchronizing with each other using a channel. And we have just looked at an unbuffered channel and let's see if there is any potential issue with using an unbuffered channel. So I have this example from the textbook where we have the responses channel that is unbuffered and we have a return statement that receives a value from the responses channel. However, this is a single receive operation so only the fastest of the three go routines will return a response and this function will exit. So the two slower go routines would be stuck trying to send the responses and this condition is known as a go routine leak. And leaked go routines are not automatically collected so it is important to ensure that go routines terminate themselves when no longer needed. So what we can instead do is use a buffer channel. Here we have a buffer channel with a capacity of three and this channel will behave like a queue holding up to three string values and block until a space is made available by another go routines receive. It is advised not to use the buffer channel as a queue within a single go routine because channels are deeply connected to go routine scheduling and without another go routine receiving from the channel, a sender risks becoming blocked forever. So to summarize, an unbuffered channel provides stronger synchronization guarantees, but there is a risk of go routine leaks. So a buffered channel is a better option if the synchronization doesn't matter as much and you know the upper bound on the number of values that will be sent on a channel. However, it is worth noting that failure to allocate sufficient buffer capacity can lead to a deadlock in buffer channels. Moving on to running go routines inside a loop, which is pretty much the main part of this video, we have a go routine that's defined inside a loop. At first glance, it might seem as simple as just running go routine or calling go func inside a loop. However, this will exit immediately and we need to do something like what we did for the first example we saw. So we might wanna define an unbuffered channel and send an empty struct at the end of the go routine and have a loop that's blocking until it receives each of the values from the channels you have. However, as you might have noticed, we're not doing any of the error handling in this case, and there is actually an idiomatic approach to running go routines in a loop using wait group. So wait group is provided by the sync package in Go, and the wait group provides us with the add, done, and the wait method. So by adding, we are incrementing the count of the go routines and by calling done, we're actually decrementing that count. And this wait method ensures that we wait until all the go routines have executed and done has been called on each of the go routines that we added. And just to give you an idea on what we have here, we loop over the file names and run a go routine inside each of the loop. And inside each of the go routines, we retrieve the size of the file using some operations and send the value of the size to the sizes channel. And on the main go routine, we loop over the sizes channel and compute the total size of the files. And there are a few things to highlight in this pattern. First, we wanna make sure that this add method is called before this worker go routine 
and not inside it. And this is to ensure that we call the add method before any of the wait method is called. And the second thing to note is that this closer go routine that waits for all the go routines to finish and closes the sizes channel must be concurrent with this loop over the sizes channel. So if they're not run concurrently, there could be two different scenarios. We could have a scenario where a closer go routine is called before the loop or it is called after the loop. So let's look at the first scenario first. So imagine we don't have this go routine, but we're just calling these two methods inside the main go routine. And because this wait method would be blocking, we'll never reach the loop over the sizes. And therefore, the go routine will not be able to send any of its value to the receiving channel. Hence, it will just get stuck. And it is pretty much the same for the second scenario where we have these two different methods that's called after the for loop here, right before the return statement. In that case, we'll receive all the values from the sizes channel, but this sizes channel will remain open and we'll never reach this part of the code and hence will not be able to close the channel and just get stuck there. So those two scenarios just explain why this had to be run concurrently with the loop here. And this part will be quick where we'll be talking about semaphores. You might have heard of semaphores, but what we're trying to do with semaphore is to limit the number of concurrency. And just because we don't have unlimited number of CPU, memory, and network, and so on, we often want to limit parallelism using a buffer channel or what we call a semaphore. So we have two different examples here. The first one we see here, we'll also look at a second example where we use the semaphore package. And what we are trying to do here is to do something in parallel. So we'll be calling this function concurrently using goroutine. And inside this do something, we'll be running some operation. But we want to limit the number of goroutines that we have at a time to let's say 20 here. So we can define a buffer channel and call it tokens and send an empty struct to the tokens channel before any of the operations, which we call we acquired a token. And at the end of this operation, we receive from the tokens channel. And a good analogy to this is where we have hundreds of people lining up in a queue at a booth, and we only have 20 tokens available for them. So only those with the token can actually enter the booth and do something. And once they leave the booth, they can return the token. So at any given time, only 20 people can be doing something and waiting until a token becomes available. So that would be the same case here where we acquire and release the token before and after doing any operation. And as I mentioned, Go actually has a semaphore package where you can just call acquire and release on the semaphore. That's equivalent of what we just observed before. So here we have the last pattern where we want to multiplex with the select statement inside a for loop inside a Go routine. So because we have a loop, we are repeatedly waiting for an event on one of the many channels that we have inside the select statement. In this case, we only have two. And a ticker is actually a very commonly used pattern to invoke this every um, few seconds, minutes, or hours, or so on. And just one extra bit of information I want to add here. If we receive multiple values across different channels, they will be randomly picked by the select statement. And you see this case for the done channel. And a done channel is useful when we want the main go routine to tell this go routine to abandon the values they're trying to send. That way we return from this go routine and make sure we're not sending any values to the main go routine. Because when we are receiving value from the done channel, that means that the main go routine has finished. And to get a full picture of this, we need to see how we're doing this on the main go routine side. So we are defining a channel called done and we arrange for a close on the done channel to happen on the defer statement and pass this done channel down the go routine with the select statement that we saw earlier in that example. Because when this main function returns, the done channel will be closed by the deferred call here. So inside this go routine, we know that the main go routine has finished so we return accordingly without any go routine leaks. 
and that is a very common pattern that we see to cancel the go routine and avoid go routine leaks although in a lot of the cases we pass this done channel through the context and we call a timeout or a cancellation on that context which is picked up by the select statement inside the go routine that marks the end of this video I have all the information here in a blog post where I put a link in the description box below. So make sure you check that out. And if you have any questions, leave them down in the comment below. Thank you all for watching.